So they give you a little bit of something, sort of pop, sort of me, you know, a little mashup. Well, hello, friends, and welcome to Ask Zach. I bet you're asking yourself right now, how did Rick Holmstrom ended up ended up at uh, at Zach's you know studio, you know, in front of Zach's old bookshelf and all of his uh, guitar trinkets and books and everything? Well, I'm going to tell you the story. Then I'm going to let Rick talk a little bit about uh, Mavis and uh, just the joy that she has. And he's also going to play a little bit and he's going to talk about this modified broadcaster wiring that I'm trying to track down a uh, schematic for. And so if I find it, it'll be, uh, there'll be a link down in the description. But uh, regardless, I'll find some type of schematic or at least pictures of the wiring that's in Rick's guitar. And so look in the description for that. So yeah, so I'm going to tell a story about how all this took place, and then we're going to let Rick do some playing and talking. All right, so while you're thinking about it, I appreciate you hitting subscribe if you've been enjoying the channel. Also, of course, the good old thumbs up also helps. If you've already done that, then I appreciate you supporting the show. The best way is Patreon, and there's a link in the description for that. Also, there's a link to AskZach.com where you can find, like, Ask Zach merch, like this uh, t-shirt or the mug behind me, or there's just good old tip jar information, which is always appreciated. First off, a bit of old news, and that's I want to just reach out to everyone who has been so kind to me in, you know, after the, uh, the 50th birthday arthritis episode, and just the really kind things, people that have shared their own journeys with uh, different types of pain that they've had and arthritis. And so I really appreciate everyone uh, sharing their story. And I really did feel not alone uh, with, with y'all. And I've also had, I've been amazed by guitar players that I've interviewed or, or worked with in the past that have called or text me and uh, just means a lot. And it shows the kind of caliber of viewers that y'all are and uh, and I'm I appreciate it. Uh, the other thing is is that I played a couple of shows after the uh, arthritis episode and I did fine. I did have some pain, but I'm uh, you know I'm working on it. I'm uh, I'm getting better and uh, I've kind of gotten the uh, the the first thing I'm going to try besides of course I'm seeing a physical therapist is I'm uh, I'm uh, going to attempt to cut sugar out of my diet which, you know, after all my birthday celebrations, uh, I'm at a point where I can <laughs> actually do it. All right, let's dive in. So I had my 50th birthday on April the 24th. And that night, my wife gave me a card and in it, it said, you know, pack your bags. We're leaving on Wednesday on a surprise trip. And I was like, whoa, where are we going? What are we doing? And, uh, but I was, you know, cool about it and, and just so excited because, I mean, what, what a sweet thing to do. And she said we were flying someplace. And so we started, you know, we left my home and, or our home, I should say. And all of a sudden we started going in a direction that was not toward the airport. Well, we ended up going to our friends Jay and Christy Smith. And Jay is the guy that had designed all my merch and he designed the Ask Zach logo and his wife, Christy, is the one that designed the, uh, the, uh, the logo and, and the, the design that's on my 57 Esquire, which is, of course, the, uh, the cactus and my name on, the, uh, on that guitar. They are dear old friends. And in fact, they are the reason that my wife and I met. And so we stopped at their house and uh, my wife told them, hey, what are y'all doing? Y'all up for a trip? And they said, well, we just happened to have our bags packed. And so lo and behold, it wasn't just my wife and I going, but it was also our good friends, Jane Christy Smith. And so then once we got to the airport, I had a really fun thing that happened that uh, 
you know, I took every, you know, I took, you know, I was going through security and <laughs> I go through the, the, the little, you know, cubicle thing, whatever you want to call it, where they, uh, where they, they kind of have the thing that goes back and forth and you have your arms above your head and they, they kind of do a security sweep of you. Well, they point at the screen and there's this big red area right over my crotch. And I'm like, I didn't have anything in my pockets. I certainly didn't have anything extra in my pants. And uh, yeah, so they did a full heavy pat down where they put their put fingers down, you know, in the in the waistband, patted me down very heavily down there. And uh, yeah, it was uh, it was it was a little bit intrusive, but uh, I understand those guys are just doing their job. So. Anyway, we get onto the gate, and uh, by then I know that I'm going to New Orleans, and then they tell me we're going to Jazz Fest, and we're going to see Mavis Staples. And I was just overjoyed because I had just been thinking, I've, you know, Mavis is 83 years old. I have to see her, and I love Rick Holmstrom's playing. You know, I've loved his playing for a long time, and I had, of course, interviewed him for the True Tone Lounge uh, during the pandemic and such, and uh, just really wanted to uh, to see him play. So I was so excited. So we went down there. We ate like kings. Uh, we ate a ridiculous amount of of, uh, of seafood. Uh, one of the highlights was uh, Galatori's, which is a place on Bourbon Street, where uh, we had amazing food. And then uh, the, our waitress had the whole restaurant sing happy birthday to me. And then the next night we uh, we went and saw Mavis with Rick Holmstrom and they were fantastic. And it was just a, an amazing show. And afterwards we walked to a place called Katie's and there I had uh, char grilled oysters you know, on the half shell with like shrimp and, and uh, uh, bacon and cheese and stuff on there. It was just ridiculously great. Well, after the show, I, you know, I have Rick's, uh, Rick Holmstrom's, you know, number and he texted me. He said, uh, uh, some, something came up where I found out that they were playing actually in Franklin, Tennessee, which is where I live. Uh, it's just South of Nashville on Sunday night. And, uh, and he said, you know, that ought to come out. So we made arrangements, got, uh, got, tickets and such and uh, then I asked you know Rick if he could uh, if he wanted to come over and check out my tellies and uh, and show me his and so he uh, he showed me his telecaster which he's gonna do and he uh, also checked out all my all the uh, various telecasters I have including the old Esquire my 67 telly the uh, the Brad Ocaster uh, you know, black guard that uh, Brad Paisley built, he, the Dano caster that I have, and a Bill Crook telly, and you know, all sorts of other stuff. And uh, we just had a good time. And so I asked him, you know, I said, "Do you mind if I just, uh, you know, film a little bit, and uh, you could talk about this wiring scheme?" Because I really loved the way it, it sounded. And uh, so here you go. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna keep on yammering on, other to say that I had amazing time in New Orleans with my friends and I had an amazing time going to see uh, Mavis a second time. This time she was opening for Steve Miller and uh, Mavis is 83 and she put on a ridiculously great show and Steve Miller is 79 and Steve Miller put on a ridiculously great show also. So uh, you ought to, if you have the chance to see either one of them, though I'm, I'm a little bit partial to Mavis and Rick, uh, you know, cause uh, Rick plays a, a telly all night but uh wonderful wonderful show all right so here we go here's rick okay here we are are you gonna ask me something or i just start playing <laughs> <laughs> tell me about this telly okay well so this is a 56 neck that i've had for years and i had i bought i bought it from someone who was parting out a 56 telly i don't know what happened to the body but um, I bought the neck, the neck plate, the bridge, the knobs. I think that's all the 56 parts. And I'd had this neck on a few different bodies and just never really found one that spoke more uh, or, or sounded better than some of the other tellies that I had. So a lot of times I'd bring it out on a, a gig and then it would 
go back in the gig bag for six months or something. I just never found a home for it. Uh, recently, I put it on, I put this neck on my old black parts telly and it really came alive. I, had, I hadn't put it on that body before, so I knew something was happening with it. And so a few months ago, I bought this 2006 Custom Shop Fender White Guard and then put this neck on it and boom, I knew I had something kind of cool. So yeah, it's, it's um, 2006 Custom Shop body, I think, you know, a repro pick guard, repro plate, a lot of reissue parts, but with some 56 stuff thrown in it. So it's kind of like a poor man's 56. And it's got a Ron Ellis Standard Plus neck pickup and a Don Mayer 6.7K Alnico 3, kind of like black guard style pickup that I've had for probably 16, 17 years. Yeah. And it, it's just got, you know, I, and I'm, so I've got this wiring scenario going on here that is a little unusual. It's the kind of like a modified 50, early 50s blend circuit. So when I put it in the back, and I have this on three or four of my toes, uh, where everything full on is the bridge pickup. <laughs> This knob is not a tone control, but it's a blend. So it goes from full bridge to full middle. If you go all the way down, you kind of hear the chirp of the middle position. But the cool thing is you have all these variations of full bridge to, to middle, which I like to play with. And some people would prefer to have a tone control. I get that. I've done that before. But I kind of just like all these gate mouth brownish type variations. So like if you played something sort of gate mouth brown. Then you take it down a, maybe a quarter. Pretty subtle, but as you start getting closer to blend, you start hearing more. slappy middle thing and then okay so the then the other thing is neck in the middle position on this wiring where it would normally be both pickups it's just the neck without a tone control without a cap on it so it opens up like I know you like to do um, <laughs> sounding neck pickup thing going on but then when you hit it over to what is normally neck position it's it's the neck pickup with a little bit of a capacitor in but not as much as they did in the early 50s where it was completely mud <laughs> sweating and it's distorting and I go over here and I'm playing like um, Chicago blue like backing up a harmonica like like uh <laughs> provide a little bed underneath them kind of thing. So I have this friend, Steve Fazio. Uh, he lives in Joliet, Illinois. And he, um, most people in the guitar world kind of, if you know of him, you know of his Vero amps. He makes these cool, um, uh, they look sort of art deco-ish amps that uh, people like Anson Funderburg, Little Charlie, Beatty, have used before. Doug Deming has one. Um, I have one. Jeff Ross out in LA has one. And um, they're cool little amps. And Steve 
who runs an insurance company and plays with them about three bands. Um, also, he's just a great guy, long, long time friend of mine. He uh, probably 15, 10, 15 years ago started getting into buying old necks for fenders. So he's got five or six, he's got a Strat and four or five Tellys with these old necks. And then he would, a lot of times would get a music craft body, some reissue parts and make guitars based on these, these uh, old necks. Sent me, one time he sent me a, a 51 Esquire with a music, music craft body on it. Sounded great. Then he had this 51 Telecaster neck on a music craft body that I always kept gravitating towards at his, when I'd go over to his place. It just had something. So a few years ago, he lent me that guitar, which is a fantastic blackguard looking guitar with a real old neck on it. And so it kind of got me interested in like, maybe it is, there is something going on here with the old maple and you try it, you might get lucky on the first body or you might try one, two or three bodies before you marry it up there. But most of the time, our experience was the old neck will work and will really get you closer than say a lot of the newer guitars with newer necks and newer bodies. Uh, so that's where I kind of, that's when I started, uh, that's when I got this neck was when I was really thinking about that. And um, so I, I, it just almost always seems to work. Like we find these, especially if you find one that's really beat up, that a lot of times tells you that that was working for somebody back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, all these years, all these decades, it's been sweat on and it's, there's there's something about that that uh, that feel of an old neck, but also just just the the solid resonance of the maple. Our our friend Jeff Ross told me years ago that he was talking to Leo when Leo was at GNL. Leo was bringing him guitars to play at country gigs around Pomona and areas of Southern California, and Jeff finally said to Leo, like, I, I just, Leo, why don't you just make uh, your Telecaster? And I guess Leo got a little perturbed at Jeff for, for having the, 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 the temerity, I guess, to say that to Leo Fender. And um, Leo said to Jeff, Jeff, even if we did make those guitars now, the wood in the neck isn't the same. That wood was already old when I made those guitars. Like it was, I don't know if he had a big pile of old maple in the early fifties or what the deal was, but so uh, I kind of think there is something with the, with that, that old maple wood and, and Steve Fazio and I have definitely been kind of in, in that kick for a while now on that kick. And then another thing that we, we've been messing around with and I first is this blend wiring thing and the first guy that really hit me to it was Don Mayer and that would have been probably in around the early 2000 or 2005 ish four ish something like that when I really first started getting into Telecasters because I was knocked out by Gatemouth Brown's early 50s sound and all of the guys who played in the when the broadcasters and no casters and Telecasters finally first started coming around. Jimmy Spurrow, uh, of course, you know, uh, Albert Collins, and but Gatemouth Brown was really my guy. And so when you hear Okie Dokie Stomp, it's, to me, I'm hearing a good deal of middle, but those guitars didn't have middle position back then. So how did they do it? That's the thing. How did Steve Cropper do that? Or how did, were they, were they going in between? Well, Don Mayer was always, I think that's a, a broadcaster blend wiring. And then, dip, because it makes sense on certain songs like Midnight Hour or Daddy Yaddy R or whatever that song's called, it sounds like full on bridge. But then you get songs like Okie Dokie Stomp or um, uh, what's the other one? Salty something, 
I forgot the names of the songs where you hear like, oh, that sounds like kind of like there's some neck pickup in there. And so we started messing around with that. But the problem with that wiring always was this neck position when you went up here was kind of useless because it was so rolled off. So Don started this thing of modifying it and making less of a muddy sound so it was more usable. And then it, which then opens up the neck pickup to be powerful and open and more Strat-like. And, but then when you get into the bridge, you have all these variations, which I really like playing with, with Mavis, especially like, um, and, and I can be right in the middle of a song on stage using a rental amp on a stage I've never played on, playing a song where I think it's gonna work in this, but no, no, I better. And you, it's like f finer, my, more minute adjustments rather than just only being able to go back and forth between three positions, which is kind of works like if I'm going, um, sounds fine right now but on stage with the full band I might need more a little bit more bridge you know so I might dial oh it's a really dark sounding stage I better go full bridge oh it's a really bright stage better go full blend you know so that, that works for me, and I, I just, because I'm such a gate mouth nut, um, I just love that. Or get, go, you know, full bridge. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know how succinct that was, but... So, I mean, the thing with when we're out with Mavis, 90% of our gigs are fly-ins where we use rented backline. You know, if we're, if we're doing a tour, we've done tours with Bonnie Raitt or Bob Dylan or something like that, where we're out for a whole summer and we get to bring our own gear. That's great. But most of the time I show up and there's a rented amp for me. And lately it's been a Vox AC-15 for the small theaters and places and, and then sometimes an AC-30 for outdoors. Um, and I used to, whew, man, for the first, I guess, 10 years or so that I was with Mavis doing that, I would bring an overdrive pedal, a reverb pedal, maybe a tremolo pedal, and I'd get a reissue Fender Blackface Deluxe Reverb or something like that. And it was so stiff and loud and mid-rangey in a weird way that I just, I tried every overdrive pedal and boost pedal known to man. <laughs> I had never found anything that I liked. Cause I, I grew up playing like a Fender outboard reverb tank into a Tweed Basement or a Tweed Pro, just depending on the size of the room. That was my thing. And the Blackface amps with a Fender, with a Telecaster, to me, especially the, the uh, reissue stuff, which wasn't working. So then when I discovered the boxes, that warmed up the telly to me and felt a little bit more like a tweed amp. And then lately I found this thing called a Milkman. It's called Milkman the Amp 50. And it's a tube preamp that this company called Milkman makes out of San Francisco. And the way I use it is I set it on top of my amp or behind my amp, and I use the tube preamp to hit the Vox amp a little hotter. So it's like a tube boost, but it's also got great reverb, great tremolo, and really useful EQ in it. So I can get this rental amp and just take a little low end, a little high end off of it, and there's the reverb, and I, the reverb is really good, really close to an outboard reverb unit. And that's what I'm used to, going into the front end of an amp so that when you really step on the guitar, it, the reverb kind of explodes coming out of the amp. Uh, it's the, 
Yeah, I mean, it's a Hollywood Fats, Junior Watson, Mike Campbell, Neil Young thing that I've done since I was a kid. And that Milkman, I mean, you can, there's all these other functions that you can do with it where you can XLR straight to the house, you can power a cabinet with it. I have never even used one of those things. I've just only used it in front of the amp and I love it. It works in a little carrying case. I put my cables and stuff in it, I show up at any gig. I love it so much that last summer when we were out with Bonnie Raitt, I had my own amp that I was using and I still used the Milkman instead of my old reverb tank, which is saying so. So um, that's kind of what, what, what I do with these fly-ins. Um, what was the other thing we were gonna talk about? Oh, the, the you, low. Yeah, T tell about the, uh, uh... You know, when, when you, uh, the sound that y'all have is, one, talk about the uh, the whole thing about having a trio and a couple vocalists, mm -hmm. and then and then about your front of house and, and how you get kind of a clear sound with that and where there's room for everything without all that muddy low end. Yeah, I'll say when we first started with Mavis was 2007, and she had just made that record with Ry Cooter uh, called We'll Never Turn Back, which is basically Keltner, Ry, a bass player and background vocals. And that's, I love the Stax period. I love the Muscle Shoals stuff that they did. I love all that stuff. But my real favorite staple singer stuff is the VJ and then into like the Freedom Highway era stuff where it's basically just either just pops and hand claps and vocals or a rhythm like Al Duncan and Phil Up Church and Pops playing with the background vocals and some hand claps. So when we first put the band together, you know, her manager was in agreement that, he, that it would be cool if we could keep it stripped down. It helps with the, you know, the, the <laughs> us being able to travel around and, and make it work uh, financially too. But then it just became a sound that we all really started to like and just the, that's, you know, that's Mavis's thing. It's all about the vocals and the singing. So when you get some really good singers and then just a, a bare bones backing, rhythm backing behind her, that's, that seems to work fine. So that's kind of how it started and it's um, progressed over the years. Um, and, uh, you know, we made a bunch of records with her doing that lineup and it's kind of become a thing where we embrace the space and let the microphones do the work like just say you know yeah i know it's a big audience i know it's a pressure gig to everybody everybody's keyed up take a deep breath we've got these singers all we got to do is groove behind them and and then interact with them and everything's going to be cool uh, it just gives like you said, it gives all the instruments their space and their the the room to to make almost make more of an impact with less than if we had you know a horn section and a B three and a piano and everything. Yeah. And then sonically, uh, we're lucky now in the last year or so that we've been bringing our own front of house engineers with us, um, but. For, for, for about 15 years, we didn't bring a front of house engineer with us. So that sometimes could be fine, other times could be a mess. And one of the things, that, the thing that's really the bane of our existence with Mavis is our subs. So the really low end speakers that are a lot of times under the stage or just to the side of the stage. And a lot of the younger front of house engineers these days seem to really want to play with those and really bring them up loud. And Mavis is 83 years old. She's totally old school. When she hears that low end, she's wondering why we're playing with so much bass and volume. And I'll have to say, that's the PA. It's, you know, we're not playing. Oh, I don't like that. Is it totally clouds up the whole stage. It just takes over then you, you feel like you have to play louder to get to hear yourself and get up over it, and it kills the beauty of the vocals in the air. So we either turn the subs off or we barely have them on. And um, 
that seems to really work for us. And just, you know, our, we're lucky that our, our front of house people seem, that they understand that it's all about the vocals and we've got this vocal thing swimming up here and this, you know, rhythm accompaniment down in here. And then occasionally the guitar peaks up with the, the vocals and takes off when they stop singing and then comes back down here. And it just works for us. <laughs> So, tell me about working with the 83 year old Mavis Staples, who's, you know, one of my favorite vocalists and just uh, and it seems like an amazing person. She is. And it's, it's now it's gotten to the point where as I've been with her for 16 years. So she's uh, like a third grandmother to my daughters. And she's also that grandmother to a whole bunch of other people. Uh, that you know that we know that Jeff Tweedy's kids and a whole bunch of our you know our kids become have this extra grandma because of Mavis and so it becomes family in a way that you didn't expect uh, which is beautiful and on you know unexpected and just just amazing I really I hate to use that word amazing but it's it really truly is but I, I think about her and I think about a lot of times where, let's just say we're, we're traveling the day that we're playing, which is hard enough on us. I'm going to be 58 this in a month. She's 83. And so if we're traveling on a day of show and I see her backstage, she's usually kind of a little bit torn up. She's a little tired. She's trying to get herself in a position where she can sing. And then pretty soon, you know, we all go to the stage right, stage left, and we're about to go on. And she's sitting in the chair and she's got her tea. And she's still looking at us like, oh, this is, I'm kind of worried about her tonight. And she's collecting herself. And then we, we get up there and I start the song off and I call her up. And she walks over to me and she gives me a fist bump. And I look at her and I said, have fun. And all of a sudden it comes on for her. And I think the thing with her is I, a long time ago, she considered dropping out of music and her dad, she wanted to be a nurse. And her pops told her, Mavis, you're already healing people. You're already doing this and you don't even realize it. And so she went back into music thinking about it like that. And I think that she really gets something back like the giving to the, it sounds like a cliche, but it's so true with her is that she's giving her message and her energy and she's getting something back from this crowd. That's why a lot of times, like if we're playing a big festival and there's what we call a moat out in front of us where there's 10 or 20 feet of nothing but some photographers and security, it kind of kills the vibe a little bit for Mavis because she, she needs to have people right up on her She's used to, used to the amen corner or the, all right, all right, yeah, I hear you. Mm -hmm. Which honestly, a lot of times, if, if, we're, if we're in a, on a show and there's a, a, a really strong amount of, it's like an integrated audience. You know, it's like a lot of African-Americans, a lot all people from all walks of life and all ages, that's going to be an amazing show because if there's interaction, if there's people, yeah, I hear you. Go ahead on. Okay, Mr. Guitar Player. You know, we're getting all this kind of stuff. Whereas like I grew up playing in my, some of my earliest gigs when I was in LA, we're playing in, uh, you know, black clubs in South Central LA with people like Smokey Wilson and all these and Johnny Dyer and people like that. And you got a lot of that. So there was this constant back and forth between the players and the group and the audience. So uh, that's kind of a long and convoluted answer to, to your question about Mavis, but I think she gets so much back from it. And every once in a while, I wonder like, wow, you know, I wonder how much longer is she gonna do this? I, I hope she continues to do this for a long time. I think she's just getting so much. She misses it when we don't play. Like if we're off for maybe a week or two and I've got a trio gig back home and she sees 
on social media or an email or blast about the gig. She said, I'll be there. I'm going to be there. Because, you know, she lives in Chicago. She's not going to show up in L.A. But she misses it so much that she can't not do it for long. I don't know how she made it through the pandemic, honestly. Right? There was a lot of phone calls with her, with my wife and my daughters and I and Mavis on speakerphone. A lot of fun phone calls, but really just, we got to call Mavis, see how she's doing, like try to, you know, help her out a little bit. She, she just helps us, you know. She, she's just got so much joy in her that she's such the life of, of the party. Like she, when a whole bunch of people are in a room and she walks in, she all of a sudden transforms the room to the point where when we're on the road with her, we really, we really have to protect her because uh, we have to kind of shut it down after a few minutes so she can save it up for the, for the audience. Otherwise, she'll just talk and talk and talk and, and entertain and bring people together. Oh, and now I have to go through that for a few thousand people. Well, we have to be really aware of it and kind of, you know, <laughs> help her out with that. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed getting to hear Rick talk a little bit about Mavis and, of course, talking about the uh, modified broadcaster blend wiring that he uses that I think is just so cool that I'm uh, trying to decide which one of my tellies I'm going to uh, wire up that way. So I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>